Welcome to Two Pediatricians in a Podcast, a podcast where two pediatricians discuss child health topics of interest to parents in a podcast with new subjects considered every episode. I'm Dr. Lena Rostein. And I'm Dr. Dean Blumberg. And we're both pediatricians from UC Davis Children's Hospital in Sacramento, California. Hi, my name's Brooke, and I'm the mom of two little ones, a four-year-old and an almost six-year-old. And I have a question about organic food. So it's become really big lately with a lot of people taking trips to Whole Foods or Sprouts compared to all of the other stores um, because, you know, everybody thinks it's healthier, even though it is a little bit more expensive. I just wanted to see what the dangers are of not having organic food, eating non-organic, um, just because I do have two picky toddlers who... Um, you know, it's already a struggle just to get them to eat. So I'm just curious um, if spending more is actually really worth it. And if there's any specific foods that you might be able to recommend that I incorporate into their diets. Um, I also want to mention that I'm also pregnant. So um, any foods that might be helpful for a pregnant mom as well, organic foods. So these are all really important yeah, questions. Really we know that organic food is really popular right now. And She's really asking not only about her kids, but she's pregnant. Yeah, and so we know fetus. the developing fetus might be particularly vulnerable to some of the effects of some of the things we might talk about. Yeah, this is a really common question that we get now. And parents are wondering, is organic food better for their children? And of course, the idea of organic food is great. It's a great concept, but it costs more. It's pricey. So I think she's asking the basic question, like, is it worth it? Is it worth the money? Is it worth the money? Yeah. Yeah. I think we should explore this world of organics and figure this question out. But first, let's be honest with our listeners. Before researching this, did you buy organic or did you not buy organic? So before researching this, the only organic thing that I made an effort to buy was um, organic blueberries because my wife said that they're <laughs> on the dirty dozen. And I guess oh. we'll talk about that also. And so we made sure I make sure to buy organic blueberries. That was the only thing. Only thing that you would buy organic. Right. But I do garden also. And we yeah, did, we do organic garden. gardening in our backyard. Okay. Well, not strictly organic, but. I would only buy organic if it was the same price mm -hmm. as the regular. Yeah, which is not often. <laughs> not that often, as we will get into. Uh -huh. So let's dive into why we may or may not have changed our purchasing habits. Okay, so um, the world of organics. Let's let's start it, start with that. All right, so let's define what it means for a food to be organic. So I don't know the exact definition, but it means growing food and raising animals that avoids pesticides, right? Yeah, but more specific than that. Why? Because some pesticides occur naturally and they're safe and not harmful, so they're okay. Okay, so how do you define organic food? The U.S. Department of Agriculture, or the USDA, defines this as crops that are produced on farms that have not used most synthetic pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizer for three years prior to harvesting the food. And three years. So this timeline is so there's no residual non-organic materials. Right. And there needs to be a significant buffer zone to decrease contamination from adjacent farmlands. So that makes sense. Anything else? Yeah. They can't have any genetic engineering, ionizing radiation, or sewage sludge. Although I'm shocked to hear that sewage <laughs> sludge is allowed on any farm. I mean, come on. That's <laughs> gross. I'm really glad to hear that. <laughs> So basically, this is food that avoids synthetic chemicals, antibiotics, hormones, radiation, and genetic engineering. And that sounds like a, like a challenge. Yep, it is. So farmers need to pay attention to the cultivation practices, and pests, weeds, and diseases are managed by physical and mechanical and biological controls instead of pesticides and herbicides. So that sounds more labor-intensive. It's definitely more work, and I think that's why these products generally cost more to produce, and then we see the end result at the grocery store. Which is they're more expensive. Yeah. Plus, there are subsidies for farmers using conventional methods that deplete the soil, and then in turn, this requires more pesticide use. So this is kind of complicated, but that makes organics even more expensive, I guess. Mm -hmm. It does. And what about organic meat? Livestock that is raised organic must be fed organic feed live on organic land, and be raised without routine antibiotics or hormones. Like growth hormone. Right. And can the animal be treated with antibiotics if they get an infection? 
they can be treated, but then they're not considered organic anymore. Well, at least if it needs antibiotics, it can get better. (laughs) You sometimes tend to love animals more than you like humans. Well, it's okay to care about animals, right? (laughs) (laughs) Of course it is. I'm just teasing you. So Okay, so where were we? We're talking about organic food, I think. Right. Okay, so (laughs) what about terms like free range or sustainably harvest or no drugs or growth hormone used? These terms do not indicate that products are organic. But free range still seems like a better life for the animal. I think it does seem more humane. I agree with you on that. Yeah. So what about if a product is labeled natural? This means that there's no artificial flavorings, color ingredients, chemical preservatives, or artificial or synthetic ingredients. But natural does not mean organic. Right. Natural does not mean organic and that the food will be free of pesticides. So how big of a deal is organic food? I think it's becoming more of a deal. Mm -hmm. So now organic food accounts for more than 5% of total food sales. I didn't know it was that high. Yeah, and not only that, these sales are increasing an average of about 6% per year. So we can expect more and more organic foods in the markets. Yeah, and it used to be only upscale grocery stores like um, she was talking about Mm -hmm. on the call, like, um, you know, Whole Foods would carry these. But now we can see them in all of the big box stores and even discount stores as well. Mm -hmm. So organic food sounds good, but are there any real benefits compared to conventional foods? Many consumers feel that organic produce is more nutritious than produce conventionally grown. And is that true? Nutritionally speaking, organic food is not likely to be different than conventional food. So organic food is not healthier? Not healthier per se, but the most important aspect we're going to talk about is the pesticides. But let's talk about that in a second. Okay, let's talk about organic milk. Is this better than conventional milk? In general, organic milk has the same protein, mineral, vitamin, and lipid content as conventional milk. So it's the same? Well, it's not entirely clear. And why not? Organic milk might have higher concentrations of antioxidants and other desirable polyunsaturated fatty acids. That sounds good. But the studies aren't conclusive, and they think these differences might be due to farm size, the cow's diets, or other factors. So it sounds like this needs to be studied Mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Okay. What about hormones? So giving growth hormone to cows would, in turn, increase milk production. And that's good for farmers, right? Right. It makes the farm more productive. They have more milk. Does the growth hormone affect consumers of cow's milk? There are a couple of important points to consider when talking about these growth hormones. Okay. First, growth hormone is species-specific. So you wouldn't give cows human growth hormone? Nope. They get bovine growth hormone, specific for cow. So that makes sense. And growth hormones are degraded by stomach acid. So to have an effect, it would need to be injected or something like that, because if you drink milk, it would inactivate it anyway. Exactly. So any bovine growth hormone in food products has no physiologic effect on humans. Even if it just happened to be absorbed intact from Mm -hmm. the gastrointestinal tract. Okay. So that's one less thing to worry about. But what about sex steroids? Estrogens may be given to cattle to increase muscle mass and growth. Okay, so this would increase meat yield, and again, that would make um, for more Mm -hmm. efficient production. Yeah. Okay, and are sex steroids species-specific, like growth hormone? No, and they aren't degraded by the stomach either, stomach acid. Okay, so then there's a real risk of increased estrogen exposure if you eat meat from um, cows that have been treated with um, estrogen. Yeah, so that is a theoretic risk. Okay, but so that's theoretical, but what about in real life? It turns out that sex steroid levels are extremely low. Okay, they're low, but they're not, they're still there. So how low? Well, in treated cattle and untreated cattle, they still have essentially the same levels of sex steroids. So they overlap. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so this isn't really an issue? It's possible that combined with other sources of sex steroids, this may have an effect in susceptible populations during susceptible stages in life. And we're talking about growing children, so that's... Maybe sus- pregnancy. And pregnancy and susceptible children, yeah. puberty. So those are susceptible stages of life. So it I sounds know. like you're not sure. I would say the jury is still out on this one. Okay, and what about antibiotics? Antibiotics may be used in non-therapeutic doses in livestock to promote growth. So this is another way for more efficient production. Right. It's not like you were talking about earlier, like treating an infection. This is Mm -hmm. just to make them more more. efficient and to grow more. Okay. And many of the antibiotics used are similar to those used for humans, right? 
Yeah, but why are you asking me these questions? <laughs> you are the infection expert and the antibiotic expert. Well, thank you for the reminder. So <laughs> antibiotic use for growth promotion is a real concern in, in my why field. Why is that? Because the antibiotics used this way increase the development of drug-resistant bacteria. And that drug resistance that develops in the cattle could be transmitted to humans? Right, because the products that that we're getting aren't sterile, so they can be contaminated with these um, bacteria. Okay, so if they are contaminated and then the human, in turn, develops drug resistance, Mm -hmm. then what is the consequence of that? So that makes treatment more difficult. Okay, so we'd have to use, like, if we used to be able to use a penicillin, Mm -hmm. and now the bacteria they get from the cow may be resistant to that. Mm -hmm. So now we have to use a second-line agent, something that's stronger in a way, something that's more broad-spectrum. And this might be um, more expensive, or it can be more toxic. It could have more side effects. Well, that sounds scary. So I take it that you are all for organic food in this domain. Absolutely. Since organic farming prohibits non-therapeutic antibiotic use, this decreases the risk of drug-resistant bacterial infections for children. And adults. And adults. And so I think it's really important. And I do want animals to get antibiotics if they need them, if they have an infection. I care about animals, but not for this growth-promoting subtherapeutic use. Okay. I'm on board with that, too. Okay. So let's talk about pesticides. What are the concerns? All right, so we finally made it to the big concern here, pesticides. Mm -hmm. So pesticide exposure can lead to acute and chronic toxicity amongst farm workers that are working directly with the pesticides. Right, because they have a high risk of exposure. But what about, like, the average consumer? Increased exposure to pesticides in a consumer can lead to other significant things, like increased risk of ADHD and autism spectrum disorders. So ADHD is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, Mm -hmm. and autism, I mean, that's really a concern. Yeah, it's also linked to reduced cognitive skills. So that's like memory and the ability to learn? Mm -hmm. So people that have been exposed may have had lower IQs or other similar tests that are used to measure IQ. They performed more poorly. That is a real concern. And the pesticide exposure is primarily through diet? Well, it depends actually on the type of pesticide. Okay, so what do you mean? So diet is clearly the primary source of pesticides like organophosphates that are not allowed for a use around the home or garden. So that's be the, really the only way that, in general, people would mm-hmm. get exposed to those. Yeah. But pesticides are still used in homes because we want to control ants and cockroaches <laughs> and mosquitoes, and mosquitoes yeah. can transmit disease. And <laughs> so we That's a whole other topic. That's a whole other topic, right. <laughs> Uh, Right. But so household and garden sprays may be the primary source of pesticide exposure for some people. Okay. And what are some other sources of pesticide exposure? People who live near agricultural lands, fields, or golf courses can be breathing pesticides. They can actually drift as far as a mile into people's living spaces. Or even more than a mile in some cases, right? Yeah. So that is one way that people can be exposed. So it's really hard to control, like, the air that we breathe. And, Yeah. yeah, we can't always control where we can live for various reasons, but we can control what we eat. Yeah. So pesticides aren't used for organic produce production, so they must have lower levels, right? That's right. Eating organic produce results in less pesticide exposure. But what if the produce is rinsed first? Can't you just rinse the pesticide off? I think... That's sort of what I had thought initially, but that's actually not the case. Washing produce reduces but does not eliminate pesticide residue. So kids should only eat organic produce, and this will decrease the risk of ADHD (laughs) and of um, hyperactivity and autism, and then they can avoid deficits (laughs) in learning, memory, and ability to pay attention, right? Well, it's not always so black and white like we wish it were, Dr. Dean, but I think that avoiding them could reduce the child's risk of developing these things. And we know that eating organic isn't going to cause a child any harm. But it could harm the pocketbook (laughs) because they cost more, right? Yeah, they are more expensive. Okay, so any other concerns with pesticides? There are some studies to suggest that pesticide exposure is linked to the development of Parkinson's disease, cognitive decline later in life, and fertility issues. So this isn't just a pediatric issue. It's not Mm -hmm. just a problem related to children and kids. It's important for adults, for the whole family. Right. But I want to emphasize that the connection is not definitive. Okay, I got that. But (laughs) any other pesticide concerns? There's a huge pesticide concern that we haven't talked about. And what's that? Cancer. 
This has been big in the news lately as a recent study looked at organic food and cancer risk. So pesticides can cause cancer? Mm -hmm. In fact, in the 2015 IARC, which stands for the International Agency on Research on Cancer, it's part of the World Health Organization, they classified three common pesticides as carcinogenic to humans. Can you tell us which pesticides they are? Glyphosate, malathion, and diazinon, right? Yeah. Okay, so what cancers do they cause? Malathion is associated with prostate cancer. And diazinon? Lung cancer. And then all three? They're linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So that's pretty scary. Yeah, and not only that, depending on the specific pesticide, for most people, the primary exposure to pesticides in the general population was through their diet. And so that's why discussing food in relation to pesticides is so important. Right. And in the United States, more than 90% of the population has detectable levels of pesticide in their urine and blood. 90%? Yeah, I know. That's incredibly high. That's kind of a shocking number, right? Yeah. yeah. You can see how widespread the exposure is if 90%, you know, 9 people out of 10 are going to have pesticides. Right. And it's significant enough to be absorbed into the body. Mm Mm-hmm. And I bet I have it. Well... In this, out of the three of us in this room, probably all three right. have it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> tell us about this recent study that looked at organic food and the relationship to cancer. They looked at organic food intake and they followed participants for five years to see if they developed cancer. And what did they find? It turned out that people with the highest consumption of organic food had a 25% lower risk of developing cancer. That seems really significant. 25% low. Who wouldn't want a 25% lower risk of developing cancer in the next five years? Not many people. Yeah. And there were other similar studies that found more than 20% lower risk of lymphoma with people that ate a significant amount of organic foods. Okay, so this proves that eating organic foods decreases cancer risk, right? We can't go that far. Why not? Well, I won't go into detail, but in this type of study, there are lots of weaknesses. Like people who eat organic may have other lifestyle differences. So they may exercise more, they may smoke less, there may be some other contributing factors. Okay, so the relationship between organic food consumption and cancer risk is not 100% clear. It's uncertain, but it is definitely suggestive. So should we be recommending not eating conventionally grown produce to avoid pesticide exposure? (laughs) Definitely not. Why not? We can unequivocally say that there's compelling evidence that a healthy diet with fruits, vegetables, protein, and a little bit of dairy, even if conventionally grown, benefits overall health. So the possible risk of pesticide exposure is outweighed by the benefits of a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've talked a lot about nutritional and toxic effect concerns that may cause parents to prefer organic products. Mm -hmm. What about the feasibility? What do you mean by that? So it sounds like in many cases, organically produced food may be less efficient, Mm -hmm. and it results in lower yields. Although this might be changing because we're working to increase the yields in organic farming. Okay, but in general, organics are going to be more expensive, right? Yeah, they will. So how, how significant is this? There's a lot of variability, but on average, organic foods cost 50% more than their conventionally produced counterparts. That's a lot. That's that's significant. It is significant. That's why it's an important decision for parents to make. So that gets back to the question, is it worth it? Is it worth it to spend 50% more on average for these organic products? Right. It would be worth it if we knew that consuming organic food led to improved overall health. Right. So... Organic diets we know lead to less pesticide exposure, and we know that is related to human disease. Right, so we know it's related to neurodevelopmental outcomes like ADHD and autism. And maybe cancer. So that sounds like it's a real plus. Yeah, and less exposure to antibiotics we talked about. Thank you for reminding me of that. It's important. <laughs> so there's less risk of antibiotic-resistant pathogen exposure. Mm-hmm, but nutritionally... They're about the same, uh, right? Yeah. So these are mostly positives, and there's no real downsides. Except for they're really expensive. Right, except for the price, right. So if you're considering if it's worth the cost, it would be nice if we had a study that proved that organic diets led to healthier children. And we don't have a study like this? No, they're very difficult studies to do. So are are organic foods only theoretically better? I think we can make a stronger statement than that. Okay, like what? 
I would compare it to what we knew in the 70s or 80s about lead exposure. Okay, so that's when I was being <laughs> trained. <laughs> but I wasn't alive yet. <laughs> right, I was being trained in medical school and uh, being trained in my pediatric residency mm-hmm. in the wow. 80s. And we knew then that lead exposure led to brain damage in kids. Right. And now we screen lead levels. Mm -hmm. We've removed it from gasoline and from paint. Right, right. So we had enough information back then to make these recommendations. Mm -hmm. And so we know that now about uh, about organics and pesticides and neurodevelopment and cancer. And the information we have on the effects of pesticide exposure is similar to what we knew in the 60s about smoking and lung cancer. And we knew enough then for a Surgeon General's report to come out strongly linking smoking and cancer. Right. And the amount and quality of the data that we have now is arguably even stronger for pesticides. Okay. So it sounds like we're going to make a stronger statement. I mean, what what is the bottom line? First of all, we know that the nutritional differences between organic and conventional produce appear to be minimal. Okay, but I think the pesticide consideration is really important. It is important. So organics contain fewer pesticide residues, and consuming organic is an advantage since we know that pesticides can cause these neurodevelopmental problems for children and have been strongly linked to cancers. And the antibiotic issue is theoretically important. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the consideration of hormones... There's no evidence of clinically relevant differences in organic and conventional milk. So what advice do you have for parents? Kids and children should always eat a health-promoting diet. Which means? A diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and low-fat or fat-free milk and dairy products. Okay, but what advice do you give regarding organics? I would say that the main reason to choose organics is to decrease pesticide exposure. Right. And there are dozens of studies, a great deal of clear toxicology and knowledge that children are much more vulnerable to pesticides than adults. So that means that children have the most to gain by eating organic. Mm-hmm. And pregnant women. And pregnant women. I think women. we can extrapolate to Absolutely. pregnant women. So... Are we recommending organic foods for healthier children? I think we are. All right. So we've got a clear conclusion. There's no waffling. (laughs) Just an organic waffle. (laughs) Huh? (laughs) (laughs) All right. So we are going where the science and evidence leads. And that leads to organic food is safer food. Exactly. And opting for organic will lead to healthier children down the line. And healthier children grow into healthier adults. Right. So is this recommendation all or none, or should some organic foods be prioritized and maybe not go all organic because of the price difference? Yeah, I think that's a really reasonable strategy. Because we've been talking about organic food as one big category, but pesticide exposure, for example, is not the same among all fruits and vegetables, right? Right. So for example, conventional avocados, cantaloupes, honeydew, cabbage, and corn have very low pesticide levels. So there's no need to make an effort to spend more money and buy these products as organic. Right. But conventional strawberries, spinach, grapes, and peppers have higher pesticide residues. So for these products, you want to opt for organic. For for them, it'd be worth it. It would be worth it. So it makes sense to opt for organics only for those prioritized foods with higher pesticide exposure and, and residues. I agree. So then we're only paying these higher prices for the one things that really matter. So how, how are we going to remember all this? Because which, which organic foods are they going to know to prioritize? Well, you can check out the Environmental Working Group website. They're also known as EWG. They have all of this information listed really clearly and nicely. Okay, so we'll post a link on our website, right? Right, and they have a dirty dozen list. Okay, those are the top 12 produce items to opt for organics. And they have a clean 15 list. And those are for produce that you don't need to buy organic because conventional products have low pesticide levels. Right. I think it'd be a good idea just to kind of print those out and put them on your fridge just so you remember. Mm -hmm. Or bring them with you to the grocery store. Or bring them with you to the grocery grocery store so, yeah, you don't forget. So are there any other practical money-saving tips for families that want to increase organic consumption but are turned off by the higher prices? Yeah, store brands also have organic options now, and they can be more reasonably priced compared to some of the name brand products. So that's a good tip. And always compare prices when you go. That's what I do. So I'll check out the bananas and check out the conventional versus the organic. Um, Although I am saying that I'm going to opt more for organic after this episode. So it doesn't (laughs) hurt to look and compare prices. And frozen organic vegetables can be cheaper than fresh. But what about the nutritional quality of frozen vegetables? Similar in quality. So it's worth it to check out the frozen section. 
Okay, so we've been talking about decreasing pesticide exposure related to food, but we also talked about other sources of pesticide exposure. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up. Reducing environmental exposure to pesticides is also important. So how can we do that? In your house, choose non-toxic pest control methods rather than spraying pesticides. So for example? Like ant hotels with boric acid. Or diatomaceous earth? Yeah. Okay, so this is probably especially important in the kitchen, right? Right, because if you think about spraying it in the kitchen, it contaminate your food. And then you eat it and you fire pesticide exposure. It can contaminate. I just merged contaminate into one. Oh. (laughs) It works. It's a new word. Okay. (laughs) So let's get back to our call earlier. Okay. So she was asking, should she do organics for her kids? I think especially during pregnancy right now for herself. For herself. She should do organic. And for the kids? I think she should do it too, especially using that clean 15 list. Mm-hmm. She can, she may not have to get. Not for all of them. Not, not for all not, of not them. Not for honeydew or cantaloupe. But she can use example. the dirty dozen and the clean 15, and that's a good place to start. And she also mentioned that her kids were picky eaters, but this really shouldn't affect that because mm-hmm. the nutritional quality is the same. The taste should should be the be equivalent, right? Exactly. Okay. And. That just um, reminds me of a joke. Uh-oh, <laughs> okay. not a Dr. Dean joke again. So why are organic bananas never lonely? Why? Because they hang around in bunches. Oh, that's not a great one. That's <laughs> not your best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not my best. So we thank Dr. Irva hertz Picciato from the Mind Institute at UC Davis Children's Hospital for reviewing today's topic, although myself and Dr. Lena take responsibility for any errors or misinformation. That wraps up today's episode of Two Pediatricians in a Podcast. You can find more information about all of these subjects on our Facebook page, T-W-O, Peds in a Pod, all one word. Our website is at blog.ucdmc.ucdavis.edu slash two peds in a pod slash. Follow us on Twitter at two underscore peds, the number two underline P-E-D-S. Or Instagram at the number two peds in a pod, no spaces. If you're enjoying listening to our podcast, please rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have feedback on this show or topics you would like us to discuss in the future, we'd love to hear from you. You can call us at 916-915-3388. Or email us at two, the number two, peds in a pod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and we hope you'll join us for our next podcast. Two Pediatricians in a Podcast is sponsored by UC Davis Children's Hospital. I have to ask you more about your garden since you said you mm-hmm. have an organic garden. Mm-hmm. So what we do with the garden is it wasn't always organic, but, um, you know, we've learned, I've learned that it's easy to do organic gardening. Um, it's organic in that. Um, but it hasn't been three years since so you sw- switched well, no, to organic. Well, no, it's been more than three years since oh, I've been doing it. But, okay. you know, you go to the nursery, you can buy organic tomato plants. Right, right. And, um, and in the in the winter, we have a winter garden. So right now, um, we've got organic um, lettuce, cauliflower, um, arugula is growing mm. there. And what else? Anyway, we do we do a lot of a lot of lettuce and stuff like that in the winter. Do you uh, find it tastes better? You know, what's fun is going, like, you get home after work, and you go out in the garden, and you pick your salad, right? Yeah, and you just, like, nice. pick it, and then you, like, go in and you wash it off, and because yeah. there can be slugs and snails and stuff, so that's gross. <laughs> but And it's not hard to be organic, and there are some things like slugs and snails that are a problem, and there are organic products out there that do control mm-hmm. them. And in the summer, one problem we have with the—we love tomatoes, fresh-grown tomatoes, yeah. and with the tomatoes, one of the problems we have is— um, is tomato hornworms, which are really quite beautiful. They're <laughs> bright green with some red coloring, but Ooh. but they can be extraordinarily destructive to the, the tomato tomatoes. plants. Yeah, and so I hate them. <laughs> I, I just hate them. I thought you were an animal lover. I am, but not toma- not when they try to eat my tomatoes. <laughs> And so for the tomato hornworms, there are organic products that are available that you can spray onto the plants that really okay. control them very well. I, fi- I find they control them very well. Yeah, nothing stays alive in my garden. No? No, I've tried, but so far, unsuccessful. Well, do you get enough sun in your garden yeah, to, to grow fruits I, and, ve- I and think vegetables? That, yeah, probably. It's just a residency um, schedule. <laughs> not enough time. It's not conducive to go gardening. Uh-huh. Plus the 10 
the 10 month old puppy is also oh yeah not conducive to gardening yeah well i used to blame the dog for any time a tomato plant died i'd figure he stepped on it but <laughs> turns out that wasn't the case <laughs> but i'll make sure to take a picture of our our garden yeah and, we would and, love to see a picture of your garden yeah i'll, I'll put it on the website yeah